You may be seated. Join me in a word of prayer. Oh God, open us up today, open eyes that we might see and ears that we might hear your word in the midst of these words. Open up our hearts, God, that your word might fall in and change us from the inside out that we might serve others with our hands open. Amen. A couple of years ago, a survey came out. Many of you saw it because you spoke to me about it. You went through all the papers and, you know, across the news. It said that in the last year, 38% of pastors had seriously considered um, leaving the ministry. Um, And often after church, people ask me out in the gathering room, well, are you in the 38% that considered leaving the ministry? And I said, I want to meet someone in the other 62% because I don't know any pastor who hasn't considered leaving the ministry. Um, The truth is that, you know, it had been a hard year. I I ran across this uh, the other day. Um, This is from May. Reuters, May 1st. Almost a third of the nurses in the United States are considering leaving their profession after the COVID-19 pandemic left them overwhelmed and fatigued, according to a survey. Nurses too, I guess. An online survey of 1,291 teachers by the Charles Butt Foundation shows more teacher dissatisfaction at Texas school districts as Texas school districts scramble to attract talent. Of those surveyed, 77% of them seriously considered leaving the profession in 2022, a 19% jump from the 2020 results. And among those teachers, 93% have taken steps to leave, such as preparing resumes or conducting job interviews within the last year. So nurses, teachers, preachers. <clears throat> have you seen the, maybe the articles in the paper about what they called <clears throat> quiet quitting? Quiet quitting is, it it was talked about for a long time, for a while, and then it kind of faded back. Quiet quitting is just not quitting your job, but just not working very hard. (laughs) Just saying, I'm going to do the bare minimum not to get fired. That's my goal, is doing just the bare minimum, because I'm just kind of, I just don't feel like giving it that much anymore. Here's the thing. I share these with you, not really to talk about work-life balance or anything like that. I share it because I think it speaks to a deeper issue in us. I I think we get tired. I think we get weary. And I think it's not just about work, I think it's about life. I think we get weary about... Uh, about trying to make ends meet, and we get weary about the list of tasks on our, on our task list, and we get weary about the conflict around us and trying to figure out the right way to manage it in our own. We, we get weary about trying to make our relationships work. We get uh, 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 weary about, about all those things, all, all the, the, the challenges that come our way. We just kind of get tired sometimes. Now, add to that that those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, who have made that commitment to say, I want to be a disciple, I want to follow Jesus, I want to live and love like Jesus, we're called on to to live a different kind of life than everybody else around us. We're called to, um, well, just just got to read the, the Sermon on the Mount, which is a description of the Christian life. He says, I, I say to you, if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other, to, the other cheek to them as well. We get tired of always turning the other cheek, always having to be the person that turns the other cheek. We get tired of withholding our judgments of others. We get tired of dealing with the anger inside us that indeed makes us think, gosh, I wish I could kill that person, when the truth is it's just anger inside us and we're, the scripture says we're liable for, the, for the, the, what we're feeling in our hearts. We get, we get tired of not being all about materialism. We, we get tired of, of uh, not being about greed. We get tired of not being all about comfort and just trying to make ourselves more comfortable. Now here's why I, I share this all with you. 
because when you read the letter to the Hebrews, what we find is a community of Christians who have gotten tired. They have gotten weary of, of the Christian life. And, uh, you know, they've been told that Jesus was going to come again. And the days and years and months go on past. The decades go past. They, they pass away and their children are wondering, well, I'm a Christian. When is this day of the Lord going to come? And they find themselves uh, sort of falling behind. Sort of drifting back. And the, the author of the letter of the Hebrews is writing to them saying, oh man, please don't. I, I, uh, I think sometimes the way to describe it is in the author, the author of Hebrews found that sin was up and church attendance was down. Um, uh, Katie Montgomery Mears preached a sermon a few weeks ago uh, uh, that talked about about holding fast to community. And the scripture says in Hebrews, let us spur one another on to love and good works. And uh, let's, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Like I could say that to you all, right? I mean, there's a, 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 in, in that community, there was just this sense of how much longer do we have to wait? This beginning to give in to the cynicism. Now, here's I'm convinced we we really don't know. Hebrews is a very interesting uh, book of the Bible because we don't know who wrote it and we don't know really who it was written to. Um, it is it, it, it is purportedly a letter, but it doesn't follow a letter style. A letter style begins with from, and then it lists from to, and then it to. That's how they were written. Well, this is more like an argument. I'm convinced that the author of Hebrews, whoever it was, was a high school debater um, and had, was trained in high school debate by his speech coach. This is, the, the, the letter is written as an argument, a logical debated argument. And he uses a, a very specific approach that you would learn if you were in high school debate. He makes an assertion and then tries to justify that assertion. This is the way things are. And then he says, because this is the way things are, therefore, because this is the way things are, uses the phrase in English, therefore, since, and then restates the assertion he's just made, then goes on to say, let us, dot, dot, dot. I'll, I'll use an example. The, the uh, high school debate topic this year is housing. So someone, a high school debater, would say something like this. Housing is the most important factor in whether or not people thrive or flourish. And then would give you, I don't know, 100 obscure uh, things that they found in the library to demonstrate that. And then they would say, therefore, since housing is the most important factor, let us provide free housing to all Americans. And then they'd try and justify the impact that that would make. Well, that's exactly how this author does that. And we're going to look this week, next week, and the one after that at three of those logical arguments that the author of Hebrews makes. And today what he says is, he, he says, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and goes through those. And then he says... So, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, by the way, let me recommend that if there is a, a, a scripture passage or verses that you could memorize, if you're into Bible memory, Bible memory builds this internal Bible that you can count on in difficult times. So, so here he says, just a beautiful passage, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside all the weight and sin that clings so closely and run with perseverance the race that's set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarded its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. To, to be able to say that over and over to yourself, let us lay aside the sin and and uh, weight that clings so closely and run with perseverance, the race that's before us. All right, so what I'd like to do is look at this, this since phrase. He says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he, he's made an assertion in chapter 11, and he's demonstrated, here's the cloud of witnesses in front of you. 
And he, there's like 17 of them there. I'm just going to share with you um, uh, uh, four of them. Um, he says, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. So he's saying, uh, Noah, because he lived his faith, it isn't what he it isn't that he believed in something, it's that he actually took what he believed in and put it into action. He is a witness to faith in action. Then he says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. So Abraham is a witness to faith in action. Uh, this is my favorite, because this is not about Moses, it's about his parents. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months, because they could see he was not an ordinary child. I think they're talking about my grandchildren, not an ordinary child. Um, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. So there's like, he goes through all of these different uh, Old Testament witnesses and says, these people lived by faith. So because they lived by faith, since we have this cloud of witnesses, we too should live that way. We should, too should run our race that is put in front of us. When you look at this list of, of saints who have gone before us, Perhaps there are some that you know well. And you can think about the ways that they made an impact on you. How they demonstrated faith in action. How they gave of themselves in many ways as a witness to you. But it may be that you don't know any of those. And I know that all of you have your own saints who went before you who had their ups and downs, their valleys and, and their mountains, and continued to witness to the love of God in your life. You maybe, when you think back, what you remember is something very visceral, like their smile. Or you can hear them laugh. Or you can remember their words of encouragement to you. These are those who've gone before. Uh, when I think of my mother, for example, the, one of the images that, that just uh, sticks with me, we would, when my kids were small, she lived in Destin, Florida, and we would go every year for our family vacation to, uh, to Destin. And she would put out, I mean, dinner was, she made dinner for us every night and provided a, rented a condo for us to stay in. And I mean, she, she put out the, what a great vacation she made. But at the end of the time, when it was time to go home, we would all pile back into the Suburban, and, and I can remember us pulling out of her driveway. Her driveway had pine needles all on the floor, and pulling out of her driveway and see her standing in front of her garage with tears flowing down her face as we were leaving. And I would think about her love for us, loving us so much, but at the same time knowing that she needed to let us go. You know, uh, just these powerful pictures for all of us that are the demonstrations of what God's love actually looks like in our lives as witnesses to what faith is. Now, you may not know any of them, and you can still look at this list and say to yourself, those are the people who have helped to form this community of faith that I am now a part of. And so I owe them, uh, their witness to, the, to who we have become as a church is so significant. Them and those who went before them and those who went before them. I, I, here's a, the best illustration I can think of. If, if you ever go to, um, uh, to Gettysburg and you walk into the cemetery and you look at each of those those names that are there, over 3,000 names of those killed in battle at that place. And you see those names, and I don't know a single one of them. Not one. And yet that picture is, is an impact, makes such an impact, and, and makes me so grateful for those who gave of themselves that my life would be what it is right now, that our country would be what it is right now. 
when we look at the list of names, we don't need to know them to recognize their witness of faith. They are the fabric. They're each a thread in the fabric that holds us together. So all, all of those who have gone before us have been a witness to faith in action, and we have experienced that. But I want you to see this in a second way. It's like one of those, uh, photo, those pictures that you can look at, and it looks like two different things, depending on who you are, well, or, you know, or what you're seeing. And all of a sudden you go, oh, I see it the other way now. Um, to say that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses is also to say we are surrounded of people who are witnessing us who are watching us, who are watching us run our phase of the race that's set before us. What are they watching? Are, are they, do they, do they believe in us? Do they care about us? Are they, are they encouraging us? What is it that, that, uh, helps us to know that we're not alone in, in this place. You know the feeling you have when um, you're grieving and you think to yourself, gosh, if I could just have just one more, one more day with them, or if, they could, if I could just hear their voice one more time, or, or that weird feeling that happens when something happens to you and you think, oh, I, I need to call them. And you pick up the phone and you go, oh, I can't do that. And, and you're like, ah. Oh. Here's the good news. They are with us in a way still. The scripture tells us that they're with Jesus. And the scripture tells us all the more that Jesus is with us. Always Jesus is with us. And if they're with Christ and Christ is with us, then they are with us in a way we don't quite yet under, still understand. That we are with them in Christ as part of that church that includes the church visible and the church triumphant. Let me talk to you about the Astros for just a minute. Um, so in, in 2015, the Astros drafted Kyle Tucker. And um, he played in the minor leagues for a few years. And then in 2018, he came on to the major leagues. And he was a scrawny kid. Did, did you, I, I, he was just a skinny kid. And I, it looked like he was just starting to shave, maybe, you know? He was not, just looked like very young. And he did okay. And then he went back in the, in the off season and they beefed him up. And he came back and started hitting these home runs. And it was, wow. They are, he, Kyle Tucker is hitting home runs. And they started calling him King Tuck. And... If you go to Minute Maid Park, out in the right field at every game, there is a whole host of people who are wearing little gold crowns, King Tuck crowns, and they're holding up big signs that say, Go King Tuck! And every time he comes up to bat, there's woo, hoops and hollers and yells, and everybody is cheering for King Tuck. It is the best thing possible. Here's what I want you to know. You have in right field a whole host of people who are wearing crowns in your honor and are holding up signs that say, go Tom, you can do it. Don't quit, don't give up. We're with you. You're the best. Even when you play like Cal Tucker did during the playoffs when it's not going so well. And you're not hitting so great. You know, they're still yelling, you, you, we still love you. We still love you, even though you stink right now. Right? They, we have that cheering section. That's the cloud of witnesses who are cheering us on. So let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Because we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses who are cheering us on. So what is the let us? Well, the let us is, let us lay aside the sin. Since we're surrounded, then let us lay aside the weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us, uh, here's, here's the verse that comes immediately after it. He, it says, 
Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary in your souls or lose heart. Ah, oh, that's the danger, that we grow weary in our souls and lose heart. So, he says, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame, what is broken, may not be put out of joint, but be healed. Don't give in to the cynicism. Your, your work is in vain. Christ will one day make all right and will heal that which is broken and, and fix that which needs to be repaired. Our job is to continue to, to be that witness to those who come after us. I mean, there will be a day that we read your name. On a, on a Sunday, All Saints Sunday, we'll read your name and we'll wonder what has been your witness to those who come after you. Will you have... Will you have uh, witnessed to faith in action by living out that love? My grandfather was uh, the pastor at uh, Trinity United Methodist Church in um, Beaumont, Texas. And he died when I was a really young pastor. I was uh, um, uh, er, very early in my ministry. And soon after that, a woman uh, wrote me a letter. Um, Actually, she had written this in a newsletter and copied the newsletter and sent it to me. And she was telling me that she had grown up as a child. She had seen that my grandfather had died, and she had grown up as a child in his church. And that when he was a big, tall guy, and that whenever he would see her as a child, he would stoop down like this and look her in the eye and ask her how her Sunday school was. And the whole time she talked, he just listened. And there'd be people all around wanting to talk to him, but he just listened to her. And when it was all done, he'd say, I'm so proud of you and I love you. And she said that meant so much to her. Are there, are there those who come after us that we have demonstrated faith and love in action to them so that they will say since since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run with perseverance the race set before us. My friends, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is broken, what is lame, may not be put out of a joint but be healed. Let's pray together. Gracious God, We thank you for those who've shown us what love and faith look like, who put it into action for us. And we pray that as we run our race, as we um, struggle in our battles against the sin inside us, as we find ourselves being drawn back into cynicism and weariness, that we would hear their voices cheering us on. And that we, too, would set that that witness of faith to those who come after us. In the name of Christ, amen.